It is common to have an interviewee for this series who has a long list of accolades, an international leader in their field of study, and a veritable mountain of articles that define and shape an important area of psychology that has real world implications. While Jennifer Richardson has all the common features of an interviewee, she also has some especially rare features that are noteworthy. Maybe the most obvious is nary a gray hair in sight. <laughs> While many of the luminaries who have been interviewed have all had their full careers to reflect on, Jennifer is clearly still on the upward trajectory of her career. Dare I label her mid-career? Additionally, while most interviewees are safely and soundly in their terminal institution, will they see out the rest of their career, Jennifer is less than one month away from a major transition where she will leave her long-standing home at Northwestern University for a major transition where she will be going to Yale. So not only do we have her during a career point where there is more in front of her than behind her, we also have her here today at a pivotal moment in her career as she transitions to her new home. Jennifer Richardson is a social psychologist who studies stereotyping, bias, discrimination, intergroup relations, and political psychology. To name just a few of her awards, she's the recipient of an APA Early Career Award, a Guggenheim Fellow, a MacArthur Award, also known as the Genius Award, and just a few months ago was inducted into the National Academy of Science. So I think we have to start um, at the very beginning, which apparently was only about two decades ago. <laughs> so tell us about your early life and, and what set the stage uh, for this academic career. Yeah, you know, thanks for that incredible introduction. I mean, come on now, <laughs> right? So, um, you know, I th it's funny, I think of myself as, you know, Jen, the sort of black girl from Baltimore <laughs> that I've always been, I'm from Baltimore, and you know, I, I don't, um, looking back, obviously, that time in my life really shaped who I am today. Um, but I think for reasons that are not that uncommon, especially for racial minorities, you know, in the United States. You know, so for instance, I you know, grew up in a neighborhood that was uh, economically um, sort of working class, uh, relatively predominantly white, but there was, you know, some racial diversity. I mean, you know, my family and a couple others. <laughs> and then, you know, I started uh, school at a private school that was obviously predominantly, almost exclusively white, except for my family and a couple others. And then moved to middle school, uh, public, Baltimore City Public Schools, proud product of the Baltimore City public schools, by the way. Um, and that, interestingly, was predominantly black. Um, but, you know, you started to notice that the sort of the more advanced, the, you know, the, the tracks, you know, that was tracking then, um, were more mixed and sort of maybe predominantly white. And I was sort of tracked into those classes. And then I went to a, a high school that was also predominantly black and all female and sort of different identities came to the fore, right? And I learned a lot about, you know, being sort of a female leader there because there were no boys to sort of take over everything. Um, and, you know, that was great, but I'm in this school that's probably 90% black, and my classes were probably 50% black, right? So you start to see the same patterns that are, you know, evident today, maybe even, you know, more so. And I think that just stuck with me all the way through. And then I went to Brown and, you know, all of a sudden now I'm in this sea of not only sort of predominantly white, but I mean, really rich. And I'm like, whoa, right? You know, you guys like fly to New York and have sobs and, you know, like just, <laughs> I mean, it was just stunning, you know, really stunning to me. Um, so I think just, my life, you know, navigating, you know, having to navigate these different contexts, you know, certainly made me wonder, well, who am I today? Who am I, how am I going to think of myself? And those questions, you know, luckily, it turns out social psychology cares about, although I didn't know that until much later. And so well, your father was in business and your mom was a school principal and here you had this great auspicious beginning. Did they want you to be a lawyer or an MD? Were they happy with this, uh, you know, unusual or at least not as mainstream academic scholar? They're happy now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Turned out, yeah, no, they didn't know what I was doing, right? I didn't know what I was doing either, though, right? So, I mean, we were all together, and I'm sure they would have 
been perfectly happy for for me to go into medical school, you know, go become a doctor and a lawyer or, or something reputable that's mm -hmm. likely to make some money, right? And then I did this totally other thing, which they think is interesting, but they're still not clear why I don't come home in the summers. You know, they're still not sure why I didn't graduate, I didn't get a job, at, right? You know, they're still not quite sure what I do, but apparently they do think I do it well now, which is good. Um, and they think it's kind of cool, right, uh, now. But yeah, I'm sure, right? I mean, you know, the, this, their solid careers are, um, you know, evident. And being a professor is this elusive thing. I mean, it was for me too, right? I mean, we all, we went to college and there are these people standing up teaching you stuff. And until maybe my third year, it never occurred to me that I could be one of those people, right? So, I mean, it's, I think it is an odd, thing to do and doesn't automatically come to, to everyone. You and I have a couple of shared identities, but I have to tell you my favorite shared identity that we have is that we were both pretty serious ballet dancers growing up. Uh, such an odd beginning, I know for some people in, in psychology and academia, um, but I wonder if there are clues in, in ballet, the resilience, the early rejection that you get used to, <laughs> that, I, so I'm convinced it helps you as an academic because it gives you this perseverance, this ability to get back up after getting pushed down. Um, so do you see that as relevant in your life today and, and was it an important part of your early days? Yeah, it was definitely a huge part uh, of my life until college. In fact, I sort of had the, that turning point moment. Do I go try to become a professional dancer? Do I go to college? And this is the pragmatic, right? The family, like, I think you're going to college. <laughs> that whole dancer thing is cute. And that was, you know, to make sure you walked well, right? But. We're, we're done with this. So, um, so, so but, I, but I do, I mean, so I had, um, you know, there, there's all that you mentioned, plus the um, discipline that comes from, I think, studying anything quite seriously, but certainly ballet is about, you know, discipline, discipline and calm and poise and presence. And all of those skills are certainly transferable to what we do, do now. Uh, in addition, I happen to have had, you know, I've been the benefit of so many incredible mentors and this started early. So my, my long-term ballet uh, teacher, again, she sort of took in students, uh, you know, who had some talent, obviously, but also, but not necessarily would become professional ballet dancers for whatever reason, not the right body type or just didn't want to. And she, unlike many ballet schools, she didn't turn you away and say, well, you're not worth my time. She said, no, 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 we're going to turn you into the best dancer you can be and help use this space to become the best person you can be. So she encouraged us academically. She encouraged us to explore all kinds of different types of dance. And she encouraged us to become, you know, really great dancers and then go to college. <laughs> so, you know, that, I mean, that's, it was remar remarkable. So, so um, you chose to go to college and you went to Brown. Uh, what were the, are there, were the early um, theories or professors that you uh, were especially drawn to that brought you into the fold of social psychology? So, full confession, I went to Brown um, because my brother went to Brown. And I didn't know anything about Brown. I didn't know anything about, I mean, I, you know, I heard of some Ivy League schools because, of course, but Brown wasn't the ones I heard of. Um, <laughs> but he went there and he said, you know, Jen, when I was, he was two years older, when I was thinking of getting ready, I mean, I knew I would go to college, that was required. But he said, um, you know, you should apply early someplace and, you know, early action. So then you're in and you can decide where to go later and you can apply to other schools, but you know, you're in at least one place. And I said, okay, well, I don't know what that is. And he's like, well, you should apply to Harvard, Yale or Brown. They're the only ones that have early action at the time. And so I said, okay, I'll apply to one of those. And it turns out that um, I had a ballet show mm -hmm. the weekend it was do so I didn't have a lot of time to write out the applications and the brown one you had to write it out by hand you couldn't type it turns out I didn't have a typewriter <laughs> or a computer or early word processor or whatever they had then and so I was like this is perfect so I wrote out my essays I put it in the mail I mean literally on the way to my show <laughs> I dropped in the mail at the post office downtown in Baltimore I went to my show and I forgot about it and then however many months or weeks later, it was like December, mid-December, I found out that I got in and I was like, great, check, I'm into college. <laughs> and I went, right? This made no sense, right? 
I'm, I, I have very little in common with my brother. We, we, you know, at the time, I'm not quite sure we got along. We get along great now, but still, right? It made no sense for me to go to Brown, but I did, and I'm so glad that I did, right? I mean, I, I really found these topics that I care so much about at Brown, and largely through my extracurriculars. You know, my curriculars were, you know, trying to find my way, right? I thought I was gonna be pre-med because I was good at science, and, you know, I was, might as well stay in those science classes. It turns out I don't really like sick people or blood or anything, really. <laughs> so I was like, okay, that's out. What else could I do now? I've taken all these credits. Well, I, was, I found the program in neuroscience, which wasn't a department then, but a great program. So I took all of those courses, but I had to find a major. Turns out all of those classes and all my science counselors counted for psychology. Done. <laughs> so then I took some psychology classes, not social, by the way, that wasn't offered until it was too late. So I took the ones that I needed to, to you know, get a degree in psychology. And I worked in a lab, an, an animal learning lab. Um, and it didn't occur to me until very late. Um, I took a class in the edge school, actually not in psychology department, called the Psychology of Cl Race, Class, and Gender, taught by a black female, I, my first black professor, and certainly my first black female professor. And that's when all the little pieces came together. And I just said, how is it that I become you? <laughs> and she said, well, you have to go to grad school. You can go in counseling. That sounds like sick people. <laughs> you can go in sort of personality, or you can go in social. And I was like, oh, let me see what this social psychology thing is about. And you know, I applied to a bunch of schools, and I got into one. It just turned out to be Harvard. <laughs> and I went. I tell you, I'm like, this sign Seinfeld's still a thing for you guys, right? I am the Kramer of academics. Like I just sort of have fallen into like good fortune, and I am, you know, I I'm obviously certainly grateful, but and not just good fortune. I mean, you had these advisors at Harvard, um, Herb Kelman, very special, brilliant scholar, um, but most notably the brilliant and late Nalini Embody, um, who will be remembered for so many of her contributions. Uh, not just to the field of psychology, but really she's also known for her incredible mentoring. So what was she like as an advisor? Yeah, so not only is just the best, you know, I, I, I mean, she really is. I know many of you have mentors who you think are the best, but no. <laughs> I mean, she really was the best. One, she is one of the most brilliant people I've ever met. I mean, she's just, just stunningly brilliant. And she's so um, used to being underestimated. And so she had a bit of an, a healthy edge because of that, you know? And I think, you know, there's just such a lesson in that, right? There, you're constantly, you're trying to navigate your way through, you know, this field. Um, and people don't take you seriously all the time, especially if you come in a sort of female package or a minority package or short or young or any number of things. And she just not only handled it so well, she would mentor us on that, right? So, you know, my cohort, we were some of her first students and we, she, we all had a little tiny office together. We loved being on top of each other. And, you know, every now and then she'd come in, she'd, you know, walk in and we're like, oh, you know, Melanie's here, sit up straight, look like you're doing some work. And then she'd close the door, like we need to have a conversation, you know? And she'd talk about this happened, this happened, this happened. These are some dynamics you need to think about and be aware of as a woman in science. And she just was very straightforward about it. Um, and you learn from that, okay, you're going to face some hard times, but you know what, you're equipped with the skills to manage it. And I think that's, you know, the kind of, you know, amazing mentorship, in addition to all the other great stuff she did, right? I mean, she, she for me, I was, you know, so I started grad school um, about a month after The Bell Curve was published, and of course, Dick Hernstein, one of the authors, was on the faculty at Harvard. And, you know, I'm already just, you know, I told you I got into one school, I didn't really know what I was doing, I did not handwrite that one. Um, <laughs> But you know, I'm sort of like, I don't know if I belong here. Oh, and by the way, this guy who's on the faculty also does not think you belong here, right? And I was ready to just sort of like, oh, you know, this is a good run, <laughs> good for me. I can always go to law school. <laughs> but you know, I sort of stuck it out. It was a tough first year. Um, and then Nalini came in my second year and she was the one who said, no, 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 you have a place in this field. I think you have great ideas, come you know, develop them in my lab, right? So she really 
reached out to me in a way that was super proactive and incredibly encouraging and you know was that way all the way through I mean all the way till till the end and those ideas really set the bedrock uh, for your intergroup work um, along with your colleagues and Nicole Shelton and I remember when you started research in this area it was really dominated by the social cognitive approach where uh, participants were asked to imagine what would it be like to interact with somebody different or read a vignette and then complete a paper pen uh, task and and I think of you as really a game changer so you came in and and you had people sitting across from each other real interactions measuring behavior and and the much more complicated studies um, so why did you come in and, and really I think put intergroup research on its head and and discover things that heretofore were not discovered and then was it worth all that extra time <laughs> Uh, so the second answer, yes, <laughs> it's turned out. Um, the first answer is because I didn't know what I was doing, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, there is something about the naivete of, of, you know, dancing into a field and trying to find your way, but being guided by, you know, genuine interest and being willing to put in the work. Right. And you're young enough that you've got lots, you know, that's but I could stay up late then, you know, I could really spend lots of time reading. And I just found it all so fascinating. And I just kind of had a hunch. Right. I think there's also something about following your hunch. I just the, what I was reading about, you know, just didn't seem quite right, you know, for the types of interracial interactions that I had. And I had a lot of them. Right. <laughs> Whereas a lot of the people who are writing, you know, and doing the work, didn't have a lot of them, right? And so I just wanted to try to understand how it how it all works. So I mean, some of it's serendipity, and some of it's a lot of it's naivete. I mean, I, I do think there's something to be said about trying to do something um, ambitious when you're young. But I mean, maybe a little bit more informed than, than than I was. But luckily, nobody was doing much work in the area. So I think there is something about. I mean, Paul Rosen always says this. He's like, pick an area where just there's so little activity, it doesn't even register, like on the little because you have no competition. <laughs> and so you know, it turned out actually, you know, Nicole Shelton, who was you know my great collaborator, but I didn't even know at the time, right? She was start going down this road as well, um, and Jackie Vorauer. So it was coming. It was emergent, and it was time. And I was at the right time. You know right place at the right time. So I want to stay on this idea of, of, of intergroup relations and race relations. So we're in 2016 right now, uh, the end of a two-term President Obama, uh, but that's contrasted with um, recent events in Ferguson, Missouri and in your hometown of Baltimore. So we have had uh, the gamut from uh, headlines saying racism is over to a very different kind of reality. Um, so I guess I'm wondering, what's your perception of where we are today in understanding race relations and what kind of progress needs to occur uh, for it to be different? Yeah, I mean, great question. Yeah, so I'm, I, I think the reality is closer to the reality <laughs> and not to the President Obama, right? I mean, obviously, yeah, I mean, that's just an incredible sort of national marker, right? High water mark. Right, but I think that we have this sense that that progress on any social justice dimension necessarily moves forward in this sort of upward linear way, and that's just just not true, right? And the and actual actual history, not our mythology of it, you know, demonstrates that, right? There's always been progress and then retrenchment, and progress and retrenchment, and I and I think when you think about it that way, which is sort of reality, uh, then you have to take seriously that we're in a retrenchment mode. Um, and that is also coupled with all the evidence that actually a lot has not changed for the vast majority of black Americans in 50, 60 years, right? I mean, wealth inequality is just, it looks like the 50s. Home ownership rates looks like the 50s. You know, I mean, more, infant mortality. I mean, every single disease, right? I mean, the dispar racial disparities are sh shocking and depressing. And just because we're not focusing on them doesn't mean that they're not there. And also it suggests that we, and meaning the community of social psychologists who care about inequality and racial justice are not focused on the right things, right? I mean, I had a, a real um, 
crisis of confidence in the field, actually, after um, the Trayvon Martin murder and the acquittal of George Zimmerman, um, not because it happened, and it interestingly has triggered this fascinating, you know, sort of movement, uh, Black Lives Matter movement now, but, I, but because the conversation about what was happening was so incredibly racially illiterate and dense in the media that I, I'm like, I'm somebody allegedly who is helping to shape, or at least in a field that's allegedly helping to shape how we think about race, how we think about racism. And there's no evidence that we've penetrated this conversation at all. And if anything, there's been pushback. So what are we doing, right? What are we doing, right? I didn't get into this to write journal articles, right? I got into this because of what was happening in, you know, on the ground in the world to make people's lives better. So I mean, I really had to grapple with what am I doing? And how do I want, how do I need to shift my work to be more in alignment with what I say I care about and what, what you know, questions, you know, really inform me. So, yeah, well, your work doesn't just deal with contemporary subjects. I would say, in an interesting way, your work has predicted the future. Uh, so in 2011, if, if you don't know this work, um, Jennifer and her student, Maureen Craig, uh, started a series of studies where they would prime participants with the U.S. Census data. So basically in the next 20 or so years, there's going to be a shift from the majority to um, being the minority. And, and what would happen is participants would shift their um, political ideology. And that work, now five years old at this time, um, in many ways predicted the rise of presidential candidate Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> and yet I saw no money from it. Yes, and you saw no money from it. Amazing. Um, what is that current state of the work? And I, I do have to know, did, I mean, how do you even come to those kinds of questions? Uh, yeah, and, and what's the future look like after this? Tell us who will win. Yes, well, uh, <laughs> yeah, that I don't know. Um, but yeah, you know, it's dark inside of here, Wendy. No, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, I came to that question because I was, I, you know, I mean, I, I do live in the world, right? And you hear, you know, the, you'd see media reports, right? I mean, so just on the web or on the news or, you know, I mean, on, even on NPR about the impending majority minority shift. And I'm sitting here like, okay, sometimes it's said in this like, isn't this going to be cool kind of way. And sometimes it's said, depending on the outlet, as like, white people have more babies, like, look, we're in trouble, right, you know, message. And I'm, but either way, I'm thinking, like, this can't be good, right? We do, you know, so I'm out of my crisis of confidence. <laughs> and back to social psychology of intergroup relations and certainly of social identity is incredibly old and robust and replicable. <laughs> And so we know that these types of messages that, that play into us versus them, and certainly with a nod to status and power, at least cues to that effect, are going to be, well, I, I thought would be heard as threatening. And so, you know, hunches are good, but you gotta collect the data. And so we just went to see how are, and particularly whites responding to this, and we found the low-hanging fruit, uh, expressions of greater racial bias after these messages, and then actually somewhat serendipitously found this sort of conservative shift where they would also uh, endorse more conservative uh, policy positions. And it turns out actually racial minorities, except for Latinos, sh largely so this show the same effect. Um, so, you know, we, I think we started this you know, it was a real pragmatic applied question. And, you know, I think it's, it has contributed to basic understandings about how non-existential threats might also work similar, similarly in terms of activating threat and then leading to political uh, conservatism. But I think it also has something to say to folks like the Census Bureau. And, you know, I've actually talked to the guy, he's a black guy, who, who's the head of the division who puts out these reports. And I'm like, maybe you want to frame it a little differently, you know? Because look what's happening. And he's like, hmm. Well, it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it brings up this dilemma about disseminating our findings, um, you know, uh, in terms of, of mainstream and, and their under, we're trying to understand the mind, uh, unbiased as we, as we try to be, but yet our work could be used for ill maybe even evil. So, so what, does that change anything about how you try to communicate your findings? 
so I, you know, you can't anticipate all the ways. So, you know, my initial work on how, you know, interracial interactions can be cognitively costly for, for individuals. I mean, I had no, you know, I thought that was like a, well, look, this is just what it is, and we need to be thinking about what this might mean and the implications. That was picked up by folks on the right, like, see, diversity is bad, I told you. <laughs> we should stop trying, and I'm like, that's not what I said. <laughs> but, you know, so, you know, I think you cannot be, you know, too worried about it. Um, I think, you know, I, I would often reply when that, those types of things got said about the work, like, well, no, actually, you know, turns out exercise is really hard and tiring too, but we'd never say, oh, don't bother. It's not that good for you, right? <laughs> you know, so, you know, I mean, I think you do have a responsibility, or I felt a responsibility to, to weigh in. Um, but I mean, I think you can't get too worried about it because the state of affairs, especially in this line, this new line, the state of affairs is not neutral, right? It's having an effect. Now, I was assuming that it was having an effect that was unintended by the folks at the Census Bureau. <laughs> so I'm like, look, you might want to think about other ways to frame the same information, right? White folks, white folks, you're still going to be the m most numerous group. <laughs> still have lots of high status stuff more than any other group. It's going to be okay, right? <laughs> right? I mean, you know, and we know there's no evidence from long histories of social psychology that all the so called racial minorities are going to be all friendly with each other all of a sudden either, right? So this whole the majority, the minorities are all together and they're more than, you know, 50 plus one and then there's us, it's just a fiction, but it's a fiction that's incredibly damaging. And, and it's one, uh, coupled with other things that a, at least a portion of sort of the political right is happy to capitalize upon for gain. But I mean, you know, that's how these games, I mean, you know, politics is a game for many people and they're trying to win and they're gonna use whatever uh, there is, is to, to try to win the game, so. So I want to transition a bit. Um, we have several uh, graduate students and, and early professors um, in the audience today and, and probably watching. And there's no question you're a role model for women in science and, and racial minorities. Do you have any words of wisdom for people negotiating uh, these waters and not always as friendly as we would hope? Get out now. No. <laughs> 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 no, don't get out, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, yes, I'll tell you what my mentor told me when I was teetering on the edge of exit. She said, no, Jen, in her very knowledgeable way, we need your voice in the field. And that's true. We need your voice and your unique perspective. So no, don't get out. But, um, but you do have to really want it, right? I mean, I think this is and I imagine that's true for lots of careers. You know, I don't, I, this is the only one I've ever been in, and so I don't know. But this is one that you have to really want it, right? You, you do get constant negative feedback. There are so many temptations to go in directions that, you know, you're maybe kind of interested in, or maybe you don't know that you're interested in it, but, you know, everybody else is interested in that, so maybe I should start studying that too, right? I mean, I think it's easy to, to get um, sidetracked, especially when they're, you know, rewards incentives for studying this kind of thing. That's where the money is, or that a lot of that's getting published, and what am I doing, right? So, you know, I, so I, I think you have to be clear about why you're in the field, um, or at least what you hope to accomplish. You know, I mean, it doesn't be exactly, you know, one point, but, you know, largely, and you have to try to your best to stay connected to that, right? And, and like I said, you know, after the Trayvon Martin, you know, tragedy. I mean, I really had to reassess, well, what am I doing? You know, what am I doing? And then what are we doing as a field? And I can't do that much about what we are doing as a field, but I can do something about what I'm doing. And that was a course correction for me. And then really sort of saying, okay, you need to get back to basic principles. What are, what, what, why are you in this and what are you doing? And I think that is even more true in grad school because there's so, in early career, because there's so many um, times where it is easier to just walk away right and it is and they're just you know crappy courses you've got to take and you're like what am i taking this and how does that to do with any you know saving any black lives right i mean you know i think it's like the disconnect is so so vast right and i but i think trying to remember that that this is why i'm in this game you know that motivates me to go to work right not the the little like you know what is the thing I don't know? You guys moderated mediation, right? Uh, you know, like that is, does not inspire me to go to work, right? <laughs> but trying to understand the mechanisms that really help people get clear on racial disparities and accept them as reality, 
that motivates me to go to work. So really trying to reconnect to the sort of not so fun stuff to the, you know, the, what's the goal here? What's the purpose? In addition to the work that you and your students do in your lab, you're also involved in a lot of interdisciplinary science, sort of team science approaches. But of course, team science is challenging because um, when you have a team, the data are pretty clear that women on the team get less credit for their contribution than men on the team. Um, why, why would one do <laughs> team science? Is there a benefit? And then how does one try to negotiate uh, what can be seen as a tremendous amount of work, but sometimes even subtractive to the perceived productivity? Yeah, I mean, it, it is, you know, there are all these facets of our career that we're just in life that just is just not fair. And this is one of them, right? And that's just how it is, right? At least for now. So for me, if I'm, again, if I'm really compelled by this question, then I move and make decisions that help me forward understanding of the problem, right? And I just really want to know. <laughs> and that's often requires a team, right? I mean, again, I don't even know, I just told you, I don't know moderated mediation and you could edit that out or not. <laughs> I don't, and I really don't know how that's different from mediated moderation or moder whatever, there's like a, you know, there's a whole nother one. I don't know any of those things, right? <laughs> You know, so if that's required, I surely need a team, right? And there, you can't know everything, right? You really can have only a limited expertise and actually really own that expertise and, and contribute that. And, and, and that's what I hope to bring, you know, to teams and also to use it as an opportunity to learn new things and learn new skills. And, you know, to have a, for me to continue doing this, I have to constantly be learning new things and I just I'm just curious right and so so I think yes it's true that women get less credit and yes that's unfortunate and you need to be mindful young women junior women about which teams you're a part of you know I, and, and which you you choose in, into but you know not so young women and not so young men it's our job to to correct for this bias and to promote the young, young, the youngins period, but certainly the young and not so young women on our teams and make clear where the credit belongs, right? I mean, you know, it's not the burden of the sort of the more marginal to figure out and navigate this crazy mess, right? It's the job of those of us who are established to fix it <laughs> or at least to make the, you know, sort of the, count, the correctives for what might be happening automatically. So I think at this stage, yeah, I get to, you know, do it, but I also can use an opportunity to promote junior scholars and to get them connected into these sort of teams and get the right credit. So there have been very few academics and certainly even fewer social psychologists who at such a young age have received the accolades that you've received. I mentioned the MacArthur Genius Award, Guggenheim Fellow, induction into National Academy of Science. Let me put it simply, you are a badass. <laughs> um, can you please tell us what the secret sauce is? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I mean, this is, you know, again, I'm incredibly grateful for these things that have happened to me. And, you know, and except for the Guggenheim that I actually applied for, um, I didn't apply for any of that stuff, right? So I wasn't seeking accolades, right? I'm seeking to do work I care about and to do it the best that I know how, right? And so it's not perfect, you know, but I think if that's why you're in the field, sometimes awards and accolades will come, sometimes they won't. Right? When they come early, we also know that then they multiply because people are, you know, kind of lazy. <laughs> They're like, well, who won that other thing? Well, let's give them this too, right? I mean, surely somebody's vetted them, right? I mean, so, I mean, that, that's just how it works, right? So I've been the beneficiary of, of, of all of that. And I, and I, you know, and it doesn't, for me to say that I'm not saying, you know, I didn't work hard, but I'm no more deserving of those things, things these awards that any number of people, and they just happen to have, you know, shown on me. And so, you know, The okay. secret sauce is humility? No! <laughs> I, I, I you really mean, are a badass, I, that's clear. <laughs> I think the secret sauce is doing the work and holding it to the highest standards and yourself to the highest standards that you can think of. And sometimes that will translate into awards and sometimes it won't, but it will always translate into impeccable work. Right, and that's, that's great. Love it. Uh, I'd love to know, I mean, we heard a little bit about your past work and your current work. Where, you know, you're making this transition to Yale, 
What does the next five or ten years look like for you? Where's this? Where's the future work? Are you going to predict, uh, you know, the president in 2024, <laughs> <laughs> the entire shift of Wall Street? Uh, yeah. What, what's look into your future uh, ball or crystal ball and tell us what's coming up? Yeah. I mean, so so one of the um, the great things about moving to a new institution, and this was certainly true when I moved to Northwestern from Dartmouth, is you have the opportunity to be inspired and influenced in new ways and unknown ways, right? And so that was certainly true moving from Dartmouth to Northwestern. I actually, one of the most exciting things about the move to Northwestern was I had no idea what I might be studying in five to 10 years. Whereas, you know, if I stayed at Dartmouth, I felt like I knew exactly what studies I'd be doing, right? You know, the next one and then the next one and kind of who I'd be in conversation with. And you know there was some comfort in that, but there was also some, you know, is this really it? So moving to Northwestern, you know, I, I met all these great new colleagues. I totally inspired them. I moved in this political direction in part because of you know the world is sort of in an interesting moment, but also uh, the environment that is you know at Northwestern in this great policy institute. And we're a social psychologist. Social context matters, right? We believe if we believe nothing else. We believe that to be true. And so in some ways. I don't know what is 10 years down the road at Yale because I don't really know what's at Yale, right? I mean, and or what will become emergent with the you know, faculty who happen to be there that I will you know, enter. So that's kind of exciting, a little terrifying too, um, but I know broadly it will be focused on um, helping to think carefully about the current issues of inequality, you know, broadly defined, another <laughs> Nolanism. <laughs> and certainly, you know, what's, you know, how, how can social psychology, because I do think social psychology, and this may be true in other fields, I'd have to talk to some folks in political science and sociology, but it doesn't feel as true, but I think we are adrift in our consideration or lack of careful consideration of race and race and racism. We study intergroup broadly. <laughs> we study um, prejudice and stereotyping broadly. And sometimes we channel that through a racial story, but we don't center, we don't regularly center race and racism. Uh, and that actually turns out to have consequences, right? There's some really great things about that. We can look at broad principles. We can see the commonalities. We are poised to understand some basic mechanisms of mind and brain that give rise to what we're seeing. But there, there are costs of that as well, where we miss the boat on a Ferguson, on you know, on you know, uh, on what's what does it mean that racial disparities in almost every domain have un, are unchanged from 1950? Like, what does that mean for the lived experiences of people? And how do we understand that? And how and where, how could we as social psychologists contribute to the pressing issues of race, racism? And I, you know, put immigration into that mix too, because you know, we should we have something to say. And I think we have something smart to say, but we need to center the issues. Uh, more clearly, so we can, you know, contribute. Otherwise, we just cede ground to the economists, and you know, that's not fair. To do that, yeah. <laughs> so, when we, as social psychologists, sort of turn our microscope to understanding discrimination and bias, um, it seems like you're suggesting that we're also missing some of the key pieces to our puzzle. Any insight? So, where, you know, where should a young scientist focus now? Do you think? It's just different geographically, and we're not taking account uh, in, in where these race relations are occurring. Is it because of the shifting political landscape? Is is there any sort of guidance there that you would give a young researcher? Yeah, I mean, so yeah, it's hard. It's hard for for me to to say. Obviously, I mean, people should be motivated by whatever questions motivate them. But I don't think we should necessarily, as a field, and as a new person in the field feel constrained by the paradigms and models and theories that you discover and you enter the field, right? I think sometimes you're like, well, they, especially something like intergroup, which is old as Methuselah, right? I mean, and profound and true, right? And replicable, <laughs> you know? But that doesn't mean that there aren't new important theories, principles, mechanisms that are missing from the story, or that some stuff that we think we know just isn't right in the context of sort of domestic, meaning US, 
race relations, or you know, we're missing a piece of the puzzle. And I think looking for uh, what's what's there, and obviously you've got to get an understanding of what is known or what we think we know, but also looking for and reading for what seems not quite right, and how could I test whether it's not quite right, um, especially. You know, and this was certainly true for me, and I think it becomes true for lots of people, especially scientists from underrepresented uh, backgrounds. The, the literature doesn't feel, it doesn't seem right. You know, you're like that, like I, kind of, I believe you because the data are the data, but it doesn't seem to reflect my experience, right? And I think that's an opportunity. It feels like a, a slight. I'm to be perfectly honest, when you're in the field. So my first um, time reading the classic click studies of like the scar, you know, so you guys know these studies, if not, sorry. <laughs> so anyway, he basically, so there's studies of stigma um, where Bob Clack put kind of makeup on, uh, on white people and, and some of them, so everybody, some of them thought they had, so they were like a facial scar and some people, he showed everybody and then some he took it off, right? He just wiped it away and they had them walk around the world as if they had this sort of facial scar. And you know, the people who didn't have it were like, oh my God, I was treated so terribly. You know, I was discriminated against. It was just horrible. And it led to this belief that, well, you know, stigma is kind of in your head, right? Actually, people are treating you just fine. Really, it's in your head. And I'm like, I don't know about that, not always, right, you know, like, really? <laughs> that doesn't seem quite right, you know, like, you know, my mom couldn't try on clothes in the store, right, I mean, when she was young, right, I mean, just, so I think, yes, that is true, and there are lessons and important insights into when we feel marginal, and we have no experience with it, <laughs> and we weren't raised in, with any kind of socialization to be prepared to navigate a space where you may not, uh, you know, be accepted. Yeah, that's probably how you respond. But it turns out that's actually not the lived experience of most racial minorities in the United States, right? And usually you come up in a family who's like, okay, let me tell you something, <laughs> right? You know, you had your first encounter with the little girl across the street who called your name. And you're like, what does this mean, mommy, right? You, you just, it's just not a great model of what it's really like, you know? And so being clear about that is, is hard especially as a youngin, but it opens the door for, okay, let's do some actual studies of interracial interactions and how they work with people who actually have been in their bodies the whole time. Right, and, and it reminds me of, you know, in the, in the 90s when the shift in stereotyping and bias went toward uh, reaction time tasks, complicit associates tasks, uh, that shift didn't necessarily happen with people studying the experience of discrimination and bias, right? You still would ask people, what's your life like? What's your experience of being discriminated? Um, like, and there are also sanctions and people who are reluctant to feel like they can't say, this is my experience, for whatever reason, maybe because they are unwilling to do it or maybe they're unable. And it's taken longer, I think, for that um, shift methodologically to occur on sort of the target side, the racial minority side. So, so what is that, where's that paradigm shift for understanding discrimination bias Behavior is great, it's really hard to code, but how do we get traction on understanding this without um, relying on reports that can be modified for lots of reasons? Right, yeah, well, I mean, I think there just has to be the will to do it, right? I mean, this is getting back to the effort, right? It requires more effort to, to actually go out into the world and find people who are not majority group members and study them and test them. And it's hard. I mean, my poor students, oh, good Lord, God bless you. You know, I mean, it's hard and it takes a lot of time. But if that's what you care about, you cannot rely, rely solely on analogs that might possibly mirror it, but really now we can run anybody, right? I mean, I do think there's some truth to that, so that we, you know, we did this, uh, former our student, we did a bunch of studies on uh, perceived group victimhood, and we used, you know, largely the samples were Jewish Americans, um, and those who felt that, you know, Jewish Americans were a sort of distinctly victimized group, and they sort of felt high in group victimization. We also actually did the study with a group of uh, really conservative students at Northwestern, some of whom felt really victimized <laughs> by being conservative students at Northwestern. And actually the patterns were quite similar, which was fascinating in this one paradigm. But we didn't start there and we didn't assume it would be similar, but we weren't afraid to look for similarities, right? And I think that's just what we need, a little bit of balance and not 
solely going for what's convenient. But you know, that requires lots of shifting, right? We are in a moment now where this kind of work is actually not only hard, but it's a little bit in jeopardy, I think, as a side effect of the concerns about replicability, right? I mean, if you need large N studies exclusively, well, you again, something's got to give. And this might be the kind of research that actually has to give. And that I think that's something that we should be mindful of. So we've been very serious up to this point, but I feel like I'd be doing a disservice to everybody watching this if we didn't try to get more breath of what Jennifer, Rich, what makes Jennifer Richardson tick. So I'm going to do a speed round. Okay. okay. There, here's how the speed round works. Um, I just need one word answers from you. One word, um, as quickly as possible. So you can't think about it a lot. Okay. Um, and we're just trying to get the comprehensive picture of you. Are you ready? No. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing too awful. Okay, let's go ahead and start. Yeah. Favorite author? Toni Morrison. Mac or PC? Mac. <laughs> SAS or SPSS? SAS. <laughs> Treadmill or elliptical? Neither. Step mill. <laughs> <laughs> Dog or cat? Dog. Favorite food? Chocolate. <laughs> Is that Man a food? <laughs> yeah, that's food, right? Sort of. Okay. Manila Blahnik or Christian Louboutins? Louboutins. <laughs> Good taste. Uh, favorite sports team? Oh, do I have one? I don't know. I, I, oh, I, yeah, I don't have I don't Okay. Have JPS yeah. Beer, Psych like Science. Psych like Science, of course. <laughs> Welcome, JPS. <laughs> beer or wine? Wine. Jelly beans or gummy bears? Jelly beans. <laughs> You're rooting for a sports team, Harvard or Yale? <laughs> Well, <laughs> at Harvard, I'll root for Harvard. At Yale, I will root for Yale. <laughs> In a group, you know, <laughs> trying to bring people together. <laughs> Favorite va vacation destination? Hawaii. iPhone or Android? iPhone. Best restaurant in Chicago? Well, if you want lowbrow, Harold's Chicken. <laughs> It's fantastic. A little bit higher, I would say publican. It's one of my favorite. Lots of pork. You gotta eat pork though. Oh my gosh, it's so good. And you broke the rule of one word answers. I but did. you're done. But you know. <laughs> this advice, break some rules. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Thank you. Um, so Jen, we're gonna be wrapping up soon. Um, I guess I'd I'd love to end with um, and we talked a little bit about the future and, and maybe 10 years is either not enough or not enough time to think about the big picture since you have so much time in front of you. Um, tell me a little bit about uh, what you hope to do in uh, the duration of your long career that's in front of you. What, what would you like to see um, changed or modified or different? How, how would you like to impact psychology and the world in general? Yeah, I mean, so yeah, that's huge, right? I mean, <laughs> I'd like to see many changes. Um, but let me, let me just go back to what happened for me and not really to me, right? I happened upon this course, you know, out of nowhere, psychology, race, class, and gender, and I, it changed my life. Right? It changed who I am, both the content and this sort of black woman standing for what's possible for me. Right? That's what I want to do for the rest of my career. Right? Stand for what's possible as a black woman in psychology for the undergrads, the grad students, and, and sort of symbolically, but also be a part of the diversification of our field in particular, but science more, more broadly, and the academy for sure. Right? I mean, this is something that is far more important to me than my individual research questions, right? That to me, if I you know, would use this opportunity to be at Yale to shift what I'm focused on, that's what I'm gonna be focused on, right? How do we penetrate this wall that has left the academy just so incredibly homogenous and not particularly concerned about it, <laughs> right? And not concerned meaning like the house is on fire and people are like, well, you know, <laughs> these things are hard, there's no, right? I mean, that's a, we're, we're, at a, we're at a time that we need to, you know, call to bear resources to make a change. And you know, I, I, I can't talk about it anymore. I just gotta be doing it. 
Well, um, it's been a delight talking to you, but I'd like to end with a question. It's gonna be on tape um, in perpetuity, <laughs> apparently. Um, so I'd like to um, have you promise now that we come back in 25 years <laughs> and, uh, and we look back yeah. on the full career and hear oh, what no. you have to say then. So uh, are you saying yes now? Sure, why okay. not? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being here today. Thanks for, talking for doing to this. Yeah, it's really Thanks great. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs>